ESOP sustainability is a really important topic for mature ESOP companies. And for the past 10 years, you know, we at Prairie have found ourselves more and more consulting on this topic for ESOPs that have been in place for 5, 8, 20, 30 years or more. And if there's one common thread, it's that every ESOP is different and there is no one size fits all approach. Another important to, no to note is that a proactive planning mindset can make a huge difference in sustaining your ESOP. <clears throat> well, all right, let's just kind of kick things off with some with some general basics and just, you know, when we say sustainability, what do we mean by that? Well, in its simplest form, sustainability focuses on how we can meet our present needs without compromising our ability to satisfy our future needs. In essence, it's the ability to keep something going in perpetuity, but most importantly, in healthy form. And so when we apply this concept to ESOPs, it's necessary to understand all of the important elements that need to be balanced. And most importantly, how they interrelate with one another. On this slide, we, you know, we've highlighted these important elements for ESOPs to consider. And the reality is that you can start with any one of them. They all impact each other and are all interrelated. Everything from repurchase obligation affecting cash flow, cash flow affecting value trajectory, value trajectory affecting ESOP benefits, and so on. The main purpose here is, is that you know, for ESOP sustainability, it's important for the management team and the board directors to align their ESOP policy decisions with their strategic goals and take full control of their ESOP. The ESOP is just a qualified retirement plan. And so you never hear companies say, hey, this 401k or profit sharing plan is really hindering our ability to grow the company. And so with proper, pl proper planning, quite frankly, living with an ESOP you know, shouldn't be too dissimilar. So let's begin with ESOP policy. I mean, the whole concept of ESOP sustainability begins here. These policies are first created at the inception of the ESOP transaction and effectively set the tone on how companies operate, the, operate their plan. I mean, policies such as eligibility requirements, vesting schedules, distribution policies in which these policies dictate the timing, method, and form in which participants receive their ESOP account balance upon termination. Certainly key policies here. And one, one important thing to note is, you know, not sure if anyone has seen uh, the uh, Ronco rotisserie oven infomercial, in which the phrase goes, set it and forget it. It's mentioned numerous times. But it's interesting how true of a statement that is for many ESOP-owned companies, meaning that they set their policies at inception of the plan and force themselves to live with them, set it and forget it. It's important for everyone to know that these policies are not set in stone and they, are cert and they certainly can be changed. I mean, the bottom line here is that, you know, a good idea that was, you know, five, you know, five or 10 or 20 years ago may not be the situation at the present time. And every ESOP company has differing needs when it comes to topics such as capital reinvestment, uh, deployment of cash and benefit composition requirements. Hence, it's important to know your options. And having the knowledge of the five R's is definitely a great start. Continuing on within ESOP policies, one of the things we want to mention in many cases that, you know, where questions are asked to us is, well, who are the, who's the decision maker when it comes to ESOP policy? And while it's certainly beneficial to have ESOP, the ESOP trustee, the management and board directors to be in concert with one another, you know, these are, these policies are company decisions. This is a company sponsored plan. And so having the ability to set the tone of these policies now, should come from the company and, and, and have them decide what is best suited for them. You know, there are many circumstances where an ESOP trustee decision will be needed. Uh, one example being a potential dilutive, dilutive situation to the ESOP. And there's certainly a, another, a whole host of other circumstances. Though the, the important thing here is that ESOP policies in general, you know, are corporate decisions. So just wanted to touch base on that here real quick. <clears throat> Moving on to repurchase obligation. You know, ESOP repurchase obligation is effectively the company's obligation to buy back shares from ESOP participants according to the company's ESOP document and ESOP distribution policy. The obligation is created by the ESOP put option, right to demand employer securities as provided under Internal Revenue Code Section 409H. Essentially, repurchase obligation is an off balance sheet liability, though keep in mind that many non-ESOP companies face for purchase obligation as well. I mean, internal share transactions are normal for many businesses whose desire is to remain independent and sustainable. 
So this is certainly not a new concept or unique only to ESAPs. As we kind of continue to move clockward here, we, we get to value trajectory. And now I'm going to pause here for a second. You know, we've seen many instances where the inaccurate relationship of these two elements, where purchase obligation and value trajectory, handicap key decision makers and refrain them from pursuing investments that are either external or internal and which, which will help generate value creating opportunities. Keep in mind, one of the main goals for any organization is to maximize shareholder value. And so a go or no go decision on investment opportunities should consider the interrelationship impacts of all of these elements, and most importantly, an accurate value trajectory. In many cases, we've seen repurchase obligation studies include a stagnant share price growth assumption and kind of take a lazy approach to say, okay, well, let's just kind of assume that share price is gonna grow 5% in perpetuity. Well, that type of mindset will produce inaccurate repurchase obligation results, which, is which essentially can lead to poor strategic decision-making and can have certainly an impact on overall value. So let's just go to a, you know, a quick example. Let's say you receive a repurchase obligation study, which is, encompasses kind of this stagnant share price assumption you know, say it's 5%, and the study produces, you know, alarming results, kind of forcing a company to refrain from pursuing any investment opportunity. But let's say prior to receiving these results, the company was, quite frankly, considering making a significant equipment capital purchase, which would enable the company to operate more efficiently, leading to more profitability, which would increase cash flow and pro provide flexibility to service repurchase obligations which by the way, you know, these are all levers to help increase overall value and ESOP benefit levels. And so this is a classic example of having the tail wagging the dog. And now just to be clear, it could be that not purchasing the equipment is the best decision. But the point here is understanding the interrelated relationships among all of these elements before making any important strategic decisions. <clears throat> Let's move on to ESOP benefit expectations. Many of the issues addressed in an ESOP sustainability analysis will be around employee benefit levels. I mean, in, in the early stages of an ESOP, many companies have an internal loan, which is allocating shares to participants and providing benefits via the ESOP. But what happens when that internal loan is fully repaid and shares have been fully allocated? How do you proceed from there? And what are your options? What are good questions, right? What's interesting is that in many cases, for a very long time, I'd say, we've seen mature ESOP companies, quite frankly, unable to communicate the benefit levels that are being provided via the ESOP. What, whether it's given their lack of knowledge of how their plan policies affect employee benefit levels, or just not knowing kind of the available strategies that, that are out there for them to consider. One trend that we have seen though, as of recently, I would say probably for the past five years or so, we've seen the industry certainly become a little much more educated on this front and are utilizing strategies to quote unquote, target an ESOP benefit level, which is definitely definitely an encouraging sign you know, for the industry. But just imagine being a 100% ESOP com company and not having the ability to communicate to existing employees or new employees what the ESOP means to them and what it means to them from a compensation and benefits package. And that's a, definitely a pretty tough stop, you know, spot to be in. You know, our goal here will certainly highlight certain strategies to help you manage this ESOP benefit level, benefit level and, and give you some ideas. Jumping on to management succession, you know, you know, certainly, you know, last but not least, we want to, you know, want to make sure that, you know, it's important for any organization that is thinking to be sustainable and independent in the long term to have a thoughtful process from a management succession planning perspective. I mean, bottom line, the most valuable assets for any company are the people and employees and the leadership within the organization. 